Welcome to the Academic Writing Amplified podcast. On this podcast, we believe that the culture of academia needs to change radically. Women and non-binary people are revolutionizing academia within institutions that were not built for us. If you're ready to reject the culture of overwork, kick guilt and overwhelm to the curb and amplify your voice to make a real impact on your field without breaking down or burning out, you're in the right place. With our team of experienced writing coaches as co-hosts, we'll share insights and talk to inspiring guests to bring you the practical strategies, systems, and mindset shifts you need to find time to write, publish work you love, and design your career on your terms. And it all starts with writing. Let's go. Hello and welcome to the final episode of the year of Academic Writing Amplified. I'm your host, Kathy Mazak, and I'm really excited that you're here. This episode is going to release in late December, so you can think of it as a last minute gift guide. <laughs> But this is my book review episode. So I, I always used to do like a book review podcast and a book review blog post at least once a year around this time. I don't remember if I did it last year. Probably not because my book released last year and I was just telling you to buy my book. <laughs> so in this episode, I'm going to do a little book review of five books that I read this year. Two of them are fiction. Three of them are nonfiction. We're going to do some honorable mentions, so other stuff I love that you might want to check out. And then at the very end of this episode, I'm going to give you a little preview of what 2024 is going to look like around here at Scholar's Voice. And yeah, so I hope that you, that you enjoy this episode. So I'm going to start with two fiction books that I want to recommend to you. And I read a lot of fiction. I read a lot of historical fiction. I also read a fair, my fair share of romance and fantasy. But I wanted these two books that I'm going to talk about. What I liked about them, or the reason I wanted to put them on the podcast, are that, first of all, both of them are from authors that, who I read absolutely everything they write. So I have read every book <laughs> that these two authors have published. And so I'm like on my seat, always waiting for what they're going to do next. And maybe you have some authors like that. So I wanted to share some of my favorites with you. Also, both of these books have an academic connection, I think, or like a professional connection. So yeah, that's why I thought you might be interested. All right. So the first one. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm like picking up the books and holding them while I'm talking to you. So the first one I just finished last night. It is by Lisa C. S. E. E. And it's called Lady Tan's Circle of Women. Now, Lisa C. is Chinese American. She has written some nonfiction about her family who came over during the gold rush to California. And she writes a lot of historical fiction about China. And this one in particular, I wanted to share with you because it's really about a woman. It starts when she is pretty young, about eight years old, and tells her whole life story. And she's a doctor. And she actually, the historical figure that the book is based on, was a doctor who published a book about Chinese medicine and is only one of very few women doctors, you know, who have published a book and she lived in the 1500s, in the late 1400s, early 1500s. She lived a very long time and it really is a, a lovely book about her life, a fictionalized version of her life. You get to see the role of writing in this character's life and in the lives of those around her the role of vocation or having like that, like deep calling to do something, to learn. She's like always learning and always wanting to learn. And that deep vocation is at odds with the social expectations that her mother-in-law and society has for her as an upper-class Chinese woman in the 15th century. So I recommend it highly. Lisa C., Lady Tan's Circle of Women. It also is about 
women's relationships. And sometimes, sometimes we read books about women's relationships and it's so like petty and catty and like, there's a lot of competition and, or it's all terrible. Like it's all a power play. So, you know, the women in the books are competing with each other all the time. And this is not like that. I loved that from the very beginning, that circle of women around Lady Tan, the the main character of the book, is built and that there's already at the very beginning of the book, really great support from other women in the character's life. And I love that. It's such a, like a hopeful way to enter the novel. And yeah, I recommend highly Lady Tan's Circle of Women by Lisa C. Okay. Another historical fiction that I read this year. Actually, I'm opening this up and look the boarding pass. Did I read it this year? Did I read it last year? No, I read it in 2020. Well, whatever. I'm recommending it now. (laughs) Recommending it now. And that is The Diamond Eye by Kate Quinn. Now, Kate Quinn, again, she is one of my authors that I just read absolutely everything she writes. She writes historical fiction. And she has a series that's all set in ancient Rome. She has some World War II novels. And this one is set in World War I in Russia. Let me see. Is it World War I? <laughs> Let me remember. No, in World War II in Russia. The academic connection in this book is that before the main character becomes a sharpshooter, all right, she becomes a high ranking, very good shot assassin in the Russian army. So before that though, she was writing her dissertation and she was a librarian. And this is again, based on a real figure from history, as she's talking about, like, as she's like learning to survive and participating in this terrible bloody war and all of this stuff happening, She's like, I might never finish my dissertation. (laughs) And I just felt like this was like so relatable in that way with that part. Nothing else about it I can relate to really. And that's part of why I love historical fiction because you get to be kind of involved in worlds that are so unfamiliar to you and kind of learn about them through the lens of characters that you care about. One interesting part of the novel is that the main character and this happened in real life, of course, all the accounts here are fictionalized. And there's some other bits that of plot that are absolutely fictionalized. But the main character in the book has a relationship with uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, like becomes a friend. And that was really also interesting to see. I kind of love to see characters that you know about from history, like made real and kind of three-dimensional in fiction. And Kate Quinn does a really great job of that. So Kate Quinn, Q-U-I-N-N, a double N, The Diamond Eye. Check it out. Okay. So a book that really I had had on my shelf for a long time. So I'm moving into three nonfiction books of my five books that I'm reviewing on this podcast. So a book that had been on my shelf for a long time and that I hadn't read, I hadn't picked up because actually both of these books have been in my sh- on my shelf for a long time. Sometimes I don't read books like professional or personal development books that I feel like are going to be too close to what I teach in my programs because I actually don't want like other people's ideas to kind of seep into my program. And like without me realizing it. And I have this fear of kind of copying somebody without realizing that I'm copying them. I don't know if that happens to you, maybe in your academic work as well, like making sure that I'm always really citing other people's ideas or other people's tools. And that in my programs, the ideas and the tools are mine. Like they're either a hundred percent mine that came from my brain, or they are adapted highly by me. And I acknowledge the person that I adapted the tool from And I wouldn't use it in my program unless I feel like I've adapted it so much that it kind of becomes unrecognizable. But anyway, so sometimes I I collect up books that I want to read and then I'm afraid to read them. I don't know. It's weird. But I finally read Essentialism by Greg McKeown. The last name is spelled M-C-K-E-O-W-N. 
Essentialism, the subtitle is The Disciplined Pursuit of Less. So in this year, one of the things that you may have noticed is that it's been a year of kind of, of of essentialism, actually, for me. It's been a year of deep focus and deep cutting away and culling of anything extra in terms of the business and the programs. So when we had a dip in enrollment, a pretty significant dip in enrollment in our programs, starting around September 2022, That was the first sign of this real change, I think, in a lot of online businesses that happened in 2023. So we were, in general, an online business and definitely in our little corner of the internet that is academic adjacent. In 2020 and 2021, and the beginning of 2022, because of the pandemic, people were home. They had potentially like kind of travel money or some kind of money that they could use. They use it for professional development. They were seeking community. They were seeking connection with others at a heightened level because of the pandemic and lockdowns. And so we had a boom in our programs during 2020, 2021. And we thought that 2022 was going to continue with growth. But instead, I feel like mid 2022, things started to kind of course correct a little bit. And, you know, people were talking about recession, you know, there's like a little bit more uh, the the economic climate, especially in the States, became just like more cautious in general. And so actually throughout uh, many different online businesses, you saw kind of like, if there was an expansion during the pandemic, because everybody was online, then there was a bit of a contraction. And what happened for us, what that contraction of business or that like getting smaller or not enrolling the programs to the level that we had been, what that prompted for Scholar's Voice was a simplification of everything because we just couldn't run the size of business that we had been running in 2021. So in 2023, I basically started implementing the idea of having only one program and that that program is Navigate. That is essentialism. (laughs) So that is exactly what Gregory McCohen talks about in this book, which is simplifying things down and really focusing on one thing so much so that you can really get better at that one thing. And Turns out that's what we do in Navigate as well. Like part of the thing that we talk about in Navigate is the academic mission statement. And we talk about aligning all the activities of your career to be about that. That is a form of essentialism. I hadn't read the book Essentialism in 2017 when I came up with that idea for the curriculum of Navigate. That's something that's been in the curriculum since the very start. But it is that, it's that idea. The idea that Simple is more effective. Simple is more impactful. Or you get the chance for better, bigger impact, more impactful impact (laughs) by focusing on one thing. So because we had been doing that and then essentialism was sitting there on my shelf around July, I think I was reading it actually at the retreat, at the writing retreat in July, I was reading it. And I shared some quotes from it at the retreat. And it really does like kind of take you through a process that is very, you know, in its core, it is that process that we take you through in Navigate in terms of creating an academic mission statement and then using it as a way to make decisions about your time. And I'm going to just introduce to you here. I'm just going to read a little quote from it because I like it to give you another, give you a sense of whether this is a book for you. Okay. (laughs) And to kind of, you know, something that really spoke to me in this book was the way that Greg McCohen in essentialism talks about the 90% rule. He says, you can think of this, this is page 104 in the book. You can think of this as the 90% rule. And it's one you can apply to just about every decision or dilemma. As you evaluate an option, think about the single most important criterion for that decision. 
and then simply give the option a score between 0 and 100. If you rate it any lower than 90%, then automatically change the rating to 0 and simply reject it. This way, you avoid getting caught in the indecision or worse, getting stuck with the 60s and 70s. Think about how you'd feel if you scored 65 on some test. Why would you deliberately choose to feel that way about an important choice in your life? And what really struck me about that was this idea of getting stuck with the 60s or 70s. Like thinking about everything you do and saying like, do I really want to have a career where I like most of the things I'm doing about 60%. <laughs> so that was a quote from page 104, 105 of Essentialism by Greg McCohen that I kind of loved. And he does give you a way, like a kind of decision-making process in this book. Of course, I think that our process inside of Navigate is a little bit more nuanced, especially for women and non-binary professors and, and marginalized, traditionally excluded from academia folks. So that's something to consider, but I think it's definitely a good read and I liked it. So I recommend Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less by Greg McCohen. All right. My second nonfiction book is one by Laura Vanderkam. Vanderkam is spelled V-A-N-D-E-R-K-A-M. And she wrote this book called Off the Clock, Feel Less Busy While Getting More Done. And I didn't know what this book was going to be about. But I had heard either like I heard her on a podcast a long time ago because this book, let's see, this book is from published in 2018. So I heard her on a podcast like a really long time ago. And again, this book was sitting on my shelf and I finally was like, hey, I'm going to read that book. (laughs) And here's what I love about it. It's about time. It's about the way that we think of time. It's about why sometimes do we feel like time moves really fast versus time moves really slow. So like the perception of time and memory. And I just think it's like, it's a short, easy read. It's and actually the version I have is this little hardcover version that is like a size that I love. I don't know if you all are like this with books where it's like, I love holding this one in my hand. It's just the perfect little size. I can hold it in one hand. Anyway, um, (laughs) so again, off the clock, feel less busy while getting more done. One of the big ideas that stuck to me from this book was that she talks about how when you do something over and over again, you stop like feeling like you don't remember it as like, a hundred iterations of that thing. You remember it as one iteration. So for example, every morning I drop the girls off at school. So I wake up at a certain time. I get myself dressed a certain way. I get breakfast for the kid. I I make sure they're dressed, make sure the books bags are in the car and we go to school, right? So we do it the same way every day. There's nothing about it that feels different or unusual. And so basically your brain conflates all of that into kind of one experience. Whereas, (laughs) and that's how much of our life is, right? Like our repetitive everyday life. And then you think of when you were like, when you took a trip somewhere, when you traveled and how you can remember so much more, the days seem so much longer in days that you're like touring around on vacation, then days that you're sitting at your desk with your to-do list or teaching your classes and it's like your quote unquote normal schedule. And she talks about like why that's true and then making things that you want to be memorable and how so much of this has to do, like our perception of time is very distorted. That was one concept of this book that really kind of jumped out at me. Also something interesting about Laura Vanderkam, she has the reason I guess that she started writing books what about time management and stuff was that she did a blog and she basically like was tracking her every minute of her day for several years. And so this idea of time tracking 
She's like, you don't need to do this. I'm tracking, but this is what I did. And here's some of the results from having tracked my time over years and years. Also like super intriguing. So it's, it's like a treatise on time. And so if you find yourself, I, I think that you will enjoy it. If you ever have those thoughts, like there's not enough time in the day, or I never feel like I have any time. My time isn't my own. Any of those kind of thoughts in your head. I think this would be a good one to like shake things up a little bit and make you feel different slash better about time. Interesting. And I liked it. So I recommend it. The third nonfiction book, I'm going to shamelessly plug my book. It is called (laughs) Making Time to Write. And it is available on all the major booksellers. This morning, I looked it up on Amazon and it was The price was $10.97. So this is a book that you could easily gift to any of your grad students or colleagues. And I'm starting to get like more and more people coming into our Navigate program who have read the book. And I just feel so happy about that because I feel like if you read the book, you really know what's in my head. (laughs) And so it will help you period. And it helps you get to know me and my work better. If you're interested, making time to write was designed to be read in a weekend. So it is a hundred and it's less than 200 pages long. It's a nice slim paperback format. You're busy. It doesn't have a lot of references in it. It's not a slog. It should be easy to read. And when you get the book, There'll be links inside of it that you can go and download a workbook that goes with it. If you're interested in that, some exercises and things to do, and it would be a great thing for you to do over the holidays or for you to share with someone. So if you've read it already, would love for you to review it on Amazon. That would be super helpful to me. Buy one, gift it, gift it to your grad students, gift it to your colleagues, buy a copy for your library. (laughs) That would be really, really helpful. Okay, so shamelessly, I am plugging my own book called Making Time to Write by Kathy Mazak, C-A-T-H-Y-M-A-Z-A-K. That's me. And yeah, check it out. So my five book recommendations for 2023 are Lady Tan Circle of Women by Lisa C. The Diamond Eye by Kate Quinn. Essentialism by Greg McCohen. And... Off the Clock by Laura Vanderkam, and my book, Making Time to Write by Kathy Mazak. That's me. Please read it. I think you'll like it. I wrote it for you. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I have a couple honorable mentions. One is I wanted to let you know that one of my all-time favorite books called The Slow Professor, Challenging the Culture of Speed in the Academy by Maggie Berg and Barbara K. Seeker is available on Audible. So you can go get it on Audible and listen to it. And I've always said about that book that it is like a really easy read. And you're going to get so much out of even like just the very first chapter. And also, it's not Seeker. It's Barbara K. Sieber, S-E-E-B-E-R, Maggie Berg and Barbara K. Sieber. Okay, The Slow Professor. It's on Audible. So go get it on Audible and listen to it while you're running around doing Christmas shopping or while you're (laughs) in the car. So worth it. I love it. The first chapter is like even just like good enough. Just read the first 50 pages and you will be altered. And so go get The Slow Professor on Audible. For me, it really changed my worldview. So go do that. Other honorable mentions. This, I mean, I wanted to make it five books, not six in the original list. And this one doesn't necessarily have an academic connection to it the way that the other two do. But I just wanted to say that you should read at some point in your life. It doesn't have to be now. Barbara Kingsolver's Demon Copperhead. Now, Barbara Kingsolver is also one of those authors who I read everything that she writes. I've only like skipped a couple of things. And sometimes she is writing absolutely top of the line, amazing novels. And this is one of them, Demon Copperhead. It is like, as you might have been able to guess, it's like 
David Copperfield, but set in the States and focusing on the opioid epidemic. That is the underlying kind of theme of it, although it does focus on one child who grows up during the book called Demon Copperhead. That's the child's nickname. So I think there were some times I had to put it down because I was too sad, (laughs) but it was great. It was great. And I think she really did an amazing job with it. So that's an honorable mention. And then for lighter things, for something really light and lovely, please check out anything by Emily Henry. But specifically, if you want a recommendation for people who love books, Emily Henry's novel that is called Book Lovers. So delightful. So delightful. And I think I listened to that one on Audible as well. So Emily Henry writes, I mean, I guess they're considered romance. They're not steamy. I think it's more like romantic comedy is really her style because they're funny and they're cute. And Book Lovers is about an enemies to lovers trope. So if you're into that particular trope, you will like Book Lovers. And there's a lot about like editing and publishing and book writing and authors and bookstores and libraries and things like that in Book Lovers. You can pick up any Emily Henry. Like she is, it's light and fun and funny. So like, why not? Right? (laughs) So pick up any of hers. They're smart. They're tropey though. Like it's, there's definitely like they're romance novel tropes that she's playing with, but in such a clever way and with really like funny prose and just really joyful books to read. Book Lovers by Emily Henry. That's another honorable mention. Okay. So that's my book recommendations podcast for 2023. I hope you liked it. For those of you still listening, I'm going to give you kind of like a little preview of what's coming up in 2024. We are taking next week off from the podcast. So our next episode will drop on the first Tuesday of January, which I think is January 2nd. But the first Tuesday of January will be our first new episode in 2024. And it's going to be episode number 200. So tune in to that one because I will be working on it and trying to make it really awesome because it's our 200th episode and the first episode of 2024. Now, as I mentioned earlier in this podcast, things around here at Scholar's Voice have gotten way more simple than they've ever been before. We used to have many, 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 many programs. And this has been a year of closing programs for us. And some of you are sad about it. And I want to just give a big shout out to everyone who did our alumni program, which we rebranded to be called SOAR this year. So if you did our SOAR program, if you did our Navigate alumni program, if you did our Amplify or Elevate alumni program, they all became one program this year. And then we also eliminated it. We just delivered our last week of that program in November, the last week of November. And I just wanted to thank you all who enrolled in it, who did it, who were part of it and made it such a great community. We didn't cut it because it wasn't great. (laughs) Just like Amplify and Elevate, we didn't cut them because they weren't great programs. We cut them because of essentialism. (laughs) We cut them because it became clear a couple of reasons. I don't know. I wasn't planning on going into this, but I'll give some more reasons. And if you have more questions, you can always email us at support at kathymasek.com or support at scholarsvoice.org. And if you have questions or I can answer them on the podcast, but basically we enrolled so many fewer people in our programs starting in like mid 2022 that we enrolled so many fewer people than we thought we were going to. And then we continue to keep our large team for too long. So I was like afraid to let people go. I was afraid to make some changes that I knew I needed to make to cut expenses. And we like got into like a really big revenue hole. And after lots of coaching and lots of thinking and lots of like personal development and professional development on my part, 
I finally was like, well, this is the way out of this hole is that we're going to go to one program and all roads are going to lead to that program. So that's like one reason. Another reason is really the essentialism reason, which is I'm going to put all my effort into making Navigate the best program it can be. That means advertising it on this podcast, getting people to enroll in it and working with those people to get the best results and evaluating the program, having those people evaluate their progress in the program so that we can have good data that we can share with people. And I just, I had changed the programs, like not the main content of the program, but the way we delivered it so many times. And then we also had so many other programs and I was like, well, we need to have data on our programs. It was just really hard to get good data on these moving target programs. So we have one program, we're delivering it this way, which is as a 12 week coaching program with both recorded content and a weekly coaching call that alternates between group coaching and co-writing. And that's the container. We're gonna run it three times a year and we're gonna keep doing that until it is. I mean, we're just gonna keep doing that. That's what this business is going to be. That's what Scholar's Voice is going to be at least for the next few years. And I have to keep promising that to myself over and over again. When the business is this simple, it's so much better for everyone. Like it's better for the clients. It's better for content creation. It's better for me personally to be able to handle. It's better for Paulette who does all the back ends and tech and everything. Simpler is just so much better. And the quality is just going up and up and up of our clients, of our program. It's just, I'm really happy about it. And it took us all of 2023 to close every other program except for Navigate. And even though I'm, you know, I'm also, if you're an astute listener of the podcast, you know that we did run kind of one last cohort of Elevate that started in September or October, that started in October. So I'm still delivering that. But when that ends, then Elevate will be done as well. We sunset, the sun has set on all of those other programs. For 2024, we are going to run three cohorts of Navigate. And the first one is going to start on January 29th and end on April 19th. And that is going to run on Fridays, the meeting time. So on Mondays, we'll, we'll release the new content. Every week, you'll get the content. And then on Fridays, we will have our live call. Now, we were originally going to keep our 11 o'clock call time, but I've decided to make two different call times, one for the round two and up people. And I'll explain that in a minute. And then the other call is for the new people to navigate. So the new people call will happen at noon Eastern Standard Time, the round two and up call will happen at 11 Eastern Standard Time, which is our regular call time. For, it has been our regular call time for Navigate. So I already had people enrolled in that. And then I decided to shift the call time for the new people so that we're not running both of those at the same time, but one after another. So Navigate January 29th through April 19th. The live call happens on Fridays at noon Eastern Standard Time. And the program costs $4,500. We'll be enrolling it in January for our January 29th start. Then we will also do another 12-week round in May. So our summer round, we're going to move the call time to Wednesdays because it's summer. Like Fridays in the summer, you don't want to be, you don't want to be doing professional development. So we're going to move our call time to Wednesdays and it will run about mid-May through June to the end of July. And we'll enroll that in like late April, early May. And then in August, we will go back to our Friday time and our cohort will start in sometime in mid to late August, kind of like with the start of the semester. It starts so that it ends the first week of November. So it'll be done before the Thanksgiving stuff starts and kind of before the semester goes to sideways. <laughs> and that is what's happening. Navigate January, May, and August. It's a 12 week program. And the first round of Navigate is $4,500 to enroll. And then we have, a, you take a benchmark assessment 
on the entrance to the program and also on the exit. And both times we have a call about your benchmark. So on the way into the program, it's your pre-enrollment call. On the way out of the program, at the end of the 12 weeks, we call it your benchmark call. And we talk about, okay, what did you accomplish during this round? What do you have left to do? What do you want to focus on next? Because you're not going to solve all of your problems in 12 weeks. So what are you going to focus on next? Do you want to do another round of Navigate in order to work on those skills? So that's what I was saying, that round two plus, like, so we have people who are on round two, on round three in the program. And all of those people who, if you're not round one, then you're round two plus, And we do kind of next level coaching in that version. So same thing, 12 weeks, same alternates, co-writing and group coaching. But the group coaching is a bit more up-leveled because people have been through the curriculum once already, and now they're refining certain parts of the curriculum they want to go back to. It doesn't cost $4,500 each time. It costs $4,500 the first time. And then the last, the groups that have been doing for the round two people in January, it's $900, but the price on that may go up. You know, we'll see there. So basically that is the Navigate program. The other thing we're doing is the spacious retreat in July. And we already have some people joining us for that. There are about seven spaces left. It is happening in July, July 19th through 24th, I believe are the dates. You can write to us for that. We'll actually, we'll be promoting that again in February. So keep your eyes open for that. And we had such a wonderful time last year that we're doing it again. It's happening in the Ocean Park neighborhood of San Juan. So you'll need to get yourself to San Juan and get yourself to Ocean Park, which is just like a 10 minute cab ride from the airport. It's very close to the airport and we'll be there. And we are going to have a lovely, lovely writing retreat, lots of delicious food, time for one-on-one coaching and group coaching and lots of time to write. It's spacious. It's spacious. And the group will, will be between 10 and 12 people. So that's all we're doing. That's everything that we're doing in the coming year. You might be thinking, what about the direct to university scholars voice retreats that you promoted last year? Like we're still leaving them up on the website. And if you would like for us to do basically a workshop at your university, either virtual or in person, then there's a, actually you can go to our website, scholarsvoice.org. And you can sign up to get the brochure for that. That way we have your email and we can get in touch with you and you can get kind of the the most recent pricing and brochure for those direct to university. I call them a retreat. It's really a long workshop. (laughs) They're branded as retreats. I just did one for University College London and it was so lovely. We did it over two days, which is how I'm going to do them going forward, like three hours and three hours. But also I can come to your campus. I've done them, you know, in person before. I did one at St. Lawrence in New York, which was lovely. And I went and did a two-day event there. Anyway, this is just to say, you can still do that, but we're not promoting it because it's kind of, again, like I'm not spending any promotion time on that. I'm only spending promotion time on Navigate and a little bit of promotion time on the retreat until that fills up. So That's what 2024 looks like. I got another book I'm trying to write and our family is doing some amazing things over here. And so it's a lot of energy into some new family ventures, which I'm sure I'll talk about more. And I've talked about actually on the podcast already, which is that we bought a dairy. So we're, we're, we're getting that off the ground in 2024 and it's exciting. It's fun. And it's so simple. (laughs) That's what I love about my business in 2024. It's very simple and straightforward. So if you want to join us and navigate, go to scholarsvoice.org slash navigate. If you want to help me out, but you're not going to join navigate, buy my book or share this podcast with someone or gift my book to someone. All of those would be so helpful and wonderful. Or even just go write, if you've already bought the book, go write a review. It would be so helpful, especially on Amazon, to go and write a review. 
So sending you great big hugs and a happy, happy end to 2023. You will be hearing from me again in 2024 with our 200th episode of this podcast. Thank you so much and have a great day. Bye. Thank you so much for spending your valuable time supporting yourself and your writing by listening to this episode. If you like what you heard today, the best way to say thank you is to hop on over to Apple iTunes and write an honest review. The more reviews, the more amazing academic women and non-binary people will find this podcast. So go write one now.